Okay, we can start. So, uh, I just wanted to talk about the homework uh, for a second first. So, how was it? So, what's the feedback? It's arguably the first real operating system homework. If before that we did something, I mean, it was OS ish, right? So, we loaded ELF, stuff like that, but this is like for real, boot, boot and like understand what's going on. So, what's your feedback on that? Did you enjoy it? Some people do who didn't. Medium, medium level enjoyment. Debugging was kind of difficult. Debugging was kind of difficult. And this is specifically why I wanted to, to make this like discussion today. My plan for today is to sort. I, I received a submission. I, I was, I, I mean, like I, I, I published how to debug these things, right? But like I gave the instructions, but probably it's still so unusual that it's hard to start even doing that, right? I get it. So my plan today is to start with one of the submissions, which I got, not submission, but like I, I, I got a question on, on Piazza saying, okay, my, my homework doesn't work, why? And I went in and I like helped that person, right? So my, I spent some part of the lecture today showing you how to debug this thing, right? I mean, I, I can debug slightly differently, right? I can guess sometimes what's going on, right? But uh, I'll show you how to do it properly to, to get to the conclusion, right? So that's my plan. That's why I wanted to talk about it, right? Uh, okay, like two more minutes, so, but uh, you, have, you also had a comment, right? Yeah, it felt like it was a lot of reading and that I didn't need to miss important things. Right. So it was lengthy. So I don't know how to, I mean, I, 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 was, I was trying to differently. So I was thinking, okay, do this. And I assume that people can infer those facts from, from like, from the class material. And the next homework will be more about like, do something similar to what we did in class. So less reading, more doing. This first time I wanted to give like long instructions for how it should work. I, I get it. Yeah, I, I, I understand what you're talking about. So I, I know that like it's a lengthy document. It's almost like a whatever, like a lab or like a, a blog post about. I don't know if you have an idea for how to present it better. Come talk to me. I, I would be like, I would be really open to, to hear. Can you make one example of the discussing the part of the meeting or some blog post? Right. Right. I, I, I've done it in the past, and then people just don't read it and then just hope to brute force. So that's why I put it like at least there will be some level of reading, but I get it that as long. But uh, next one will be shorter, but uh, same kind of. Next homework will be uh, construct, uh, build a tiny memory allocator similar to XV6, but slightly different, and construct these two functions kind of like allocate a page and map a page in a page table. And so we'll create a real page table by allocating pages from a pool of three pages, right? So it's kind of repeats what we've done in class. And you'll, I say, you're, you're free to copy the code from X for six. You're welcome. As long as it runs, I don't, like that's that's fine. Because by copying, you will be able to, to like to understand what's going on. Okay, so any other comments about the homework? There's one thing I noticed. Right. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I, I I know about this as well. And there's a fix. I just didn't want to push that fix this first time. Why? Well, just there was a lot of reading already. They the real fix what X six is doing. Uh, they have a pro script which scans for available ports and picks a port which is still available. And we'll do that in the next homework. Just make sure that we run this, this script, right? Okay, but what I wanted to show you, like uh, any other, maybe before I start, any other? Uh -huh. Do 
you think you can let's take it offline because yeah i left it there as an extra class extra credit class and i uh it would take me like a little longer than i want to explain it so let's but if you if you ask in piazza or something i will try to answer okay but what i wanted to show is the following so i got this submission right from a from a student and a, a person says okay it crosses and i don't know why right so let me let me let me show it to you like it's main i quickly like i unzip the file i quickly open up what's going on like uh the person actually says okay I, I went and talked to the tas they they say they don't understand what's going on on the surface it looks okay so the person like okay declares the the page table if i if i sorry click here if i do edit to uh, boot uh boot as it looks legit so everything what i was saying to do is here so maybe a space here but other than that uh we have the code which I wanted to have here, right? Uh, the C stack is uh, declared, everything. So it looks correct. So like anyone, anyone has an idea what's what can be wrong here? Okay, so maybe not a uh, not a good like. Okay, at this point, let's start. That's what I'm saying. Let's start debugging it. So. Uh, you, you're asking, what is the length of this uh, entry page table array? So it's uh, NP entry says 1024 multiplied by two. So the person just declares two of this, right? Guys, don't, don't, don't talk. <laughs> okay. Look. Maybe let's take one more guess. I mean, I, I have a guess when I saw it first, but I, it's times two, but well, they actually, okay, that's a good question. So uh, what you're saying is this entry page table is, is an array, it's times two. So it, according to the C standard, it's continuous in memory. Right, and that's a good guess, and that's actually a bug, but let's confirm it. But let's just like I I we we might have a lot of guesses, right? But let's let's just see if it runs, right? So I have it here. So in this DMP folder. I say make QMU. Again, that's how I approach it. Like, this is what I taught you. Okay, just let's run it. Uh, well, it even prints hello world. Then it lots of garbage, looks like triple fold. I've seen triple folds before, but so I understand how to deal with them. But uh, that's not very convenient. I say, look, uh, sure, that that was kind of like the, the, the output was not as fancy as I wanted it to be. So I say, let's run the same, but with a no X flat, right? So that's why there is this ta target no X. No X means that uh, because I don't, it's my session is over SSH to K, right? So that's why I don't have my X windows uh, passed back to me, right? So I don't have it. So that's why if QMO opens an X window, I don't see it, right? So that's why I use curses in the QMO uh, command, um, like no X, just ask QMO to run without no X. So it's the same thing. I don't see hello world now. But now I see a straight, straight output from the QMU, right? Okay. So what do I do next? I say, okay, look, where did we crash? It shows me an instruction pointer. You still don't really know what triple fault is. You will know on after today's and the next lecture. We'll, we'll cover interrupts, right? So that's, I mean, there is a little bit of chicken and egg. Oh, what is it? Yeah, chicken and egg broke, right? But okay, so it crosses at this uh, address, right? What's, what do I do next? What's your idea? How do I approach this debugging session? I really want to know what's there, right? So how do I know what's there under this uh, instruction pointer? Yeah, 
Uh, actually, I forgot about DB. So I, I use object dump minus D. Uh, I do, do you think I, I remember the all the whatever arguments? No, but I know that I want to disassemble. So it says, I just type it. Uh, I used to remember, but not, not anymore. Uh, what is that I want to do? Disassemble, flag disassemble. So I will minus D. I use less to pipe and see what's there, right? Uh, sorry, forget the argument. Uh, what is that we want to disassemble? We want to disassemble uh, our kernel, right? Uh, which we compiled, right? So while well, looks good. So this is the start label. This is all these instructions which print hello world. Uh, I already forgot which address was faulting. So I scroll up. Where is it? That's this one. Uh, control C. I'll search. Control B. Well, what is that? Well, I, I kind of know what it is. So it's a call to this UART, right? So if I if I open the main file, so this is my call to the UART init instruction, right? So for whatever reason, I what I know here, I know that C was running. So we boot into main, everything seems to be fine, but we are kind of crossing here. Why? Not, exa not exactly sure, right? So sometimes you can guess from this, like it, if it would be some, some other instruction, maybe I would take a different approach, but for, again, my next step is to run GDB, right? Again, so this is where it says, hits this part where you say there was a, was, a, was a ton of instructions. I already kind of like hinted how to run GDB, but no one really wants to run it because it, it's painful to even start, right? So, okay, but uh, we'll do that. So, and uh, you mentioned that instead of object dump, you can use GDB. Do you remember the command? I, I, I used to do that in, in when I was like really coding and it's actually more convenient. Yeah, so, but anyway, you can, uh, you can actually open this thing with GDB and uh, maybe like this and you say this us. It's uh, pop up. Okay. Yeah, so you can you can also get to this uh, to this address which was crossing, which is specifically this one this way, right? And this helps sometimes because then you can like query the sizes of data structure, stuff like that. So right, if some there is like there is sometimes like layout issue in a data structure or a size issue, and you you can do that with GDB. Okay, but uh, sure. So our goal is to start running GDB. Okay, cool. Uh, let me just uh, step back a little so it's, the demonstration is more complete. Uh, just do it online. I forgot. This one. Okay, cool. So like, how do I run GDB? There were instructions online, but essentially I will do GDB, QMO, GDB, uh, minus NOx. No X, uh, and what it will do is the following. So uh, again, at this point, it's nice to uh, start reading the make file a little bit, right? So, and that's why we kind of emphasize those like make file automation, right? So my normal QMO target says use curses. Uh, this flag actually we fixed it. There is a bug, so this S actually says please uh, choose a serial port and really. Uh, that was a bug in a make file, so really it should look like this, because if you don't start GDB, you don't need this minus S flag, right? Uh, and how to go about it, you just do main GDB or GDB and like figure out what this flag means. But uh, GDB, this target, which I was just about to invoke, says, okay, use this minus S flag. And if you look up the manual, it says, okay, connect to a serial port, right? Stop execution, connect to a serial port. Uh, Okay, so let's uh, let's do it. Like that's my command uh, at this point. GDB uh, QMS st starts thinking about uh, like waits for GDB, and the instructions say invoke GDB in the same in the same uh, in the same folder, right? So let me just show you online here. In uh, uh, I just wanted to make sure that we. That we're here. Oh, oh really? Uh, troubleshooting GDB, automation. <laughs> that was my part. Debugging with GDB, what specifically what I say, make QM a GDB. And uh, uh, it also says put GDB init file 
to the path of your homework three, right? So this is what I wanted to make sure that right now, if I say breakpoint start, it says, wow, I don't really have a program to run. What do you want me to do? It says, okay, I, I'll, I remember maybe like this, this is the dynamically loaded library. So it, maybe it will be loaded later. So I'll put the breakpoint later, but your intuition should say at this point that something is going wrong, right? And specifically what's going wrong here is that I don't have this GDB init file uh, in this, in this directory. So, and if we go here and, oh, where's uh, GDB in it? Maybe this link works. This is just essentially the file which we need, right? So what it says is well, like it instructs the GDB to connect to this remote port one, two, three, four, right? And this is where the QMO will be running. So I will copy this file for myself right here. I will use wget command to get it. So I got it. Now I say GDB. Uh, again, maybe I didn't, I say breakpoint start. And again, it says, okay, I'm not happy. You don't have a program running. So, but if I'm super carefully, it says, okay, wow, to enable execution of this file at this line, to your GDB init file in your in your home folder. So this is a security measure from GDB. Essentially, there were there was a range of attacks which allowed you to use GDB to attach to a running program and then like essentially get an exploit. And now GDB says, okay, I'm not gonna do it unless you specifically allow me to do it, right? Mm -hmm. And this is what this instruction is saying. And so we say, look, uh, we will go into my GDB init. This is the file which is mentioned right here. And we'll specifically put this line, nothing like super duper special, but I just wanted to make sure that we understand that it's needed there. So I I already have a line for my own like version of the homework, right? So I will add the one for this one. Got it? Okay, so this is just configuring GDB. So now GDB runs, uh, and it's still not happy. Yeah, there is a typo. That's what I was trying to. Yeah, let's. In it misses a T at the end, so now the T is there. Let's try it again. Oh, finally it says, "Okay, look, I'm happy." Uh, that's a horrible that's the color scheme. Let's zoom in a little. But now I say breakpoint on start. It's happy. I say continue. It's running. I say. Uh, I either say disass, disassemble, that's my, you know, that's clearly my hello world, that's my load uh, global descriptor table, long jump. I can also use layout as me here, that's my favorite. So I say that next instruction, we're gonna execute one instruction by another, everything is running, right? So, so how many people got to this point that were, they were using this in their homework? Not many, right? And my reason to, to show you this is to make sure that you can use this mechanism to debug the next homework, right? Because it will be a little bit harder. Okay, so cool. So again, so everything is running, long jump, uh, just, you know, super happy about what's going on. Layout split uh, because we're like about to start running C, right? So I have next instruction. So it's reloading the segments, jump to main. Right, oh, suddenly I can see the source code. And suddenly I immediately arrive to the point when it actually says I cannot access the memory at this address. Why is that? Because I was actually kind of, I said uh, next and I was trying to step over main and I just missed the point when it crashed. Okay, I'll start again. Uh, I will like quit here. I will quit my QM session. Uh, uh, like on, on Mac, I have to type control A, control, control A, A, C, or control A, A, X. On, on Windows, you probably can type just control A, X, right? So that's what I was typing. And then I'm quitting it, so I'm starting it again. I'm happy it's running. I will be just more careful with what I'm doing with GDB. So I, I kind of uh, say, okay, breakpoint on main. This time, continue. Uh, layout split to make sure that I see that the source line, or you can do even layout uh, as, oh, sorry, layout uh, SRC to just see the source code. 
uh, I say step into it. So I'll executing this loop because like executing it for 2000 times is not a big fun. So let's just do a breakpoint on this line, which is line 81. So I will just say 81, right? I'll do continue. Uh, I will do again layout as and because I want to see it or split a bit because I want to see like low level what's going on. I will do step instruction, SI steps, single assembly instruction, step S, steps of source line of the of the uh, C file, right? So, okay, what is this code? Well, I remember that inside write CR0, that's exactly what we are doing here. Uh, CR0, so that's the function which essentially uses inline assembly to like save something into CR0. And this is what it's compiled into, right? This three instruction here, no, sorry, this, uh, e, e, yeah, somehow like should be three instructions, but I see more. Okay, so it seems that okay, it's read CR0, okay, because it's two functions. Read CR0 into EX, does the OR, so far we're running good. Uh, move this, uh, we, we put the enable paging flag here, right? So that's exactly this line was doing enable paging into CR0, we're still running. And uh, I do another step instruction and suddenly we crash here. So at least at this point, I know, okay, I'm crashing here. I'm not exactly sure we're here, but somewhere here, right? Okay, let's do it again. So because, wow, I, I was, uh, I, I get it. So like my intuition at this point says, tells me that, okay, it looks that the moment that the moment I enable paging, I'm crashing, right? Because, like up until then, everything was fine. So if I ask you, what what's my plan now? So what would you do? How could you bind this? Okay. Right, exactly. That's what I would do again. Yeah, good. So let's uh, do it again. Say this one is sitting here, or it's actually, I don't have to do anything. I just quit. I'll start it again. I GTB again, break pain on break point on main, uh, continue, got there. Uh, I can do L just for layout, uh, split again. Um, I forgot what was the number of like 81, right? Uh, it tells me, okay, sure. This instruction continue again. So we're here. We haven't crossed yet. Just make sure that everything is fine here. So info M, uh, says, okay, page, paging is disabled, right, at this point. So no page table, that's natural, we didn't enable it. Info PG says the same. So going back here, so you say, can I inspect memory, which memory? Okay, let's print the page table, right? So what's the name of this variable, which we're using here? We use the variable name entry page table, control C. So you use P for print, uh, well, page table and page. Actually, all the complete works, which is nice, right? So page dir. So my page table directory has two entries. Uh, let's make it a little bit more readable because we like to see it in hex. And uh, my page table. Like this looks okay, -ish, and this looks a little bit more weird because there are some addresses which are completely look completely random, right? Do you agree with this? So, like, but why why is this okay? -ish? So okay, well that that makes sense. So maybe this is the the first uh, like page table directory should point to the page table. Page table might be allocated at one zero one zero 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 right and three is a flag right and uh but this even this address looks a little odd because it says one four why is it one four should be something like two probably here right because they should be consecutive right right so and that's how i go about it right so i see okay these two are look they look corrupted to me right uh what do we do next Oh, 
totally. So entry, I can print this, right? So this is the address, page, table, I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, so this this seems to match, right? So this seems to match to this, uh, to which one, to, 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 where is it? To this one, right? Uh, and uh, of course, I, I would assume I should see something like two here, right? Because because if I put an address 1024 here, which is, that's what I wanna see, right? But I don't see it somehow. I had, did I have a question? Yeah, I was wondering if you want to you wanted to see a value? Yeah, like I can see Yeah, so this is what's there in the entry page table, right? So this is uh, this is this, right? We printed it as an array, but GDB just simply uh, just compressed some some entries, right? So, but this is looks like this is one thousand twenty four, right? What's the memory value at one? at the entry page table directory. So once uh -huh. Uh -huh. No, but we printed them out here, but you want a specific values, right? Like this one or which index? So, so the entry page directory, the first index is one. Yeah, so this these are the two values, right? So the only two values which entry page directory has is these two. Uh, the value of the second address. Okay, cool. Yeah. So we say, look, what is what is there? Uh, like uh, we can do that. So GDB can uh, I think the syntax is this, and that's the value. So is it the value? Uh, looks like looks like a little. But also you say like, maybe I wanna round it up a little, but still, but but really what you wanna, like your intuition here that that should be my yeah. page yeah. table. And that kind of probably matches, right? But we should we should double check. So this uh, this is probably matches the the value here, right? Yeah. Plus 17, so that, that matches, right? So, okay, but so we have a memory corruption, right? So now at this point, so, we have to somehow guess how did we arrive to this, right? Uh, we can we can we can do it differently, right? So, and I at this point, uh, okay, sure. So we say, how about we're gonna monitor this loop, right, and see what's going on here? So let's quickly do it. Uh, we do it again. Mm. GDB uh, breakpoint on main. Uh, Continue, payout, mm. SRC, for example. Uh, next, uh, we start executing the loop. So our, again, our, our idea here that, uh, let's do the same prints again, print hex uh, page entry, page directory. Wow, already some garbage. That's not okay, page table. Even more garbage. Our expectation was that those should be zeros, right? Because we wanted a clean array, but maybe we say, well, maybe C screwed up something for us. So we don't trust the C at this point. And uh, we say, look, okay, sure, let's start executing this loop. Uh, we say next, uh, we write something. And we say, look, let's, let's write it, let's read it again. Uh, what is our I? I is zero, so did we read something like three? Well, looks like that that's correct because sum is zero, right? Uh, and these two flags are, we can even print something like this, I think. Let's see, or oh, not in GDB, not in current context, that should be. No, 
next. Uh, let's do it again. Didn't work. Uh, it actually should work normally. But it doesn't. Okay. But it looks like this three is correct. But still, like something is wrong. And at this point, you, I mean, we can we can go deeper uh, into this, right? Uh, my, I, I probably want to stop here just to save time. But your original guess that the fact that we allocated it on a stack messes us up. Why? Because uh, because why? Okay, tell me. Some point we hit values that we can't overwrite. Well, let's also compare like like let's take a look at where our stack is. Stack. We say C stack, H size, yeah, C stack. And it says, okay, what is this? Let's take an address of this. It's uh, it's this address. If we say these as, uh, uh, if we can also say friend size of uh, uh, C stack, and it will show us that we have 4,096 bytes on a stack, right? And at this point, you should start thinking, okay, look, I'm trying to allocate three pages, which are three times 4,096 on a stack, which is only 4,096 bytes. So clearly, they're not going to fit on a stack, right? Mm -hmm. And that's the bug in this program. And you can you can mess with it a little bit longer to understand, okay, at what point, uh, what gets overwritten? Because look, if we say entry page tier, and uh, we say, let's say, let's, let's, let's print the address of entry page tier. It's exactly, it's, it's a first megabyte. It's exactly when we loaded our kernel. So if you... Even if you're like, if you're a little bit more careful with those addresses, you say, look, uh, I, I remember I was opening object dump uh, minus disassemble build kernel. And uh, sorry. And uh, when I was piping it to less, those are the addresses which start at, uh, at uh, the address, which is uh, one page offset from the, from the one megabyte, because okay, if you, if you don't trust me, we can do Python to understand what these addresses are. Um, I control X, I control V. So this address is one megabyte plus something, right? So then you say another read elf thing uh, of your build kernel. And you say, look, uh, again, don't remember the flags, but let's say minus A. That's again, our previous homeworks teaches us that we can understand where the data section is. Uh, and uh, if I pipe it to last, it says, okay, uh, actually it should be read-only data at this address, right? And I and I see my page table there. Wow, that's that should give you a hint that you probably like something is messed up in your execution environment because you, you have your page table sitting on top of read-only data, right? So, and literally in read-only data, you should have seen some, you know, some strings and stuff like that, some sequence and strings, which, which you're currently like overwriting, right? And so if you like, if you mess with DDB a little bit more, you understand that those bits which we see in a page table are those actually parts of the parts of the data section. Agree? And uh, mm, uh, what specifically this is, it's actually multi-boot header sitting there, right? Okay, so question. Good question. So what is actually happening? So it actually it actually looks from our inspection here that when we write, what we're currently doing is we are writing here, right? Uh, page entry, page directory, sorry. We actually were like, we're not writing exactly there. So it's entry page directory, right? So it's actually sitting there. Uh, we can also say, um,
what I wanted to say. But when we we're writing into we run writing into entry page table, and uh, it seems that the writes are succeeding, right? So we're writing into this address. So specifically, we're writing into this, right? So we can say, okay, which which is it? What is this address we're writing into? And I say, look, it's exactly this address, right? And so I, I'm going to go here, and I will try to find what is there in this address. So it's right here. And uh, and uh, somewhere over here, but I don't see anything there, right? So I can I can search for this address. I can search for this address a little bit more. Sorry. So, but I specifically see that uh, it's a simple table. Uh, and uh, it seems that my write actually succeeds. So in a normal operating system, when it's promoted as a normal Linux process, the operating system would protect this memory, setting a read-only bit in a page table, making sure that you cannot write. And your write would trigger immediately an exception, right? But since we're booting on bare metal and we haven't done anything like that, we just drop just loaded us in memory. So drop. Well, you can expect from Grub to do this protection as well, but there was no page table to begin with, right? So that Grub just simply loaded the binder into memory. So we can overwrite anything. We can overwrite text section. We can overwrite read-only data. We can overwrite any part of memory at this point, right? Because we have segmentation, which says, okay, you can write anywhere from zero to FFF, right? So that's why those writes don't fail. Okay, good. Uh, Okay, so how to fix this? Okay, question. So did we did we do we all understand how to arrive to this point when we say okay, cool, right? We kind of got it. So of course I kind of skipping this step. I don't want to like really instruction by instruction go over and, and show you that I'm overriding this uh, read only section. It will take a little bit longer, but fine. So we kind of trust me. So the fix is easy, right? So we say look. Uh, we are locating those two things uh, on the uh, on the stack, and that's probably not the case. So I'll simply move these two things out and uh, put them in a global scope, saying that this will probably make sure that they they are allocated on the in a in the in the global data section, right? So that's how I will do it. Uh, I will, oops, sorry. I think it was my key bindings here. Let's try it again. Uh, oh, Mac. Okay. So execute. And I will go Z here, make clean, just in case maybe I don't trust my make file. With this uh, QMU, with GDB. Uh, Will do again my wonderful target. Uh, on is that make you be talks? Let's try it again with GDB. Uh, GDB breakpoint on main, breakpoint on uh, 81, continue to main, uh, continue to 81, uh, layout uh, split, for example, step instruction currently, step another, step another, step another. This one was crushing before. Let's see if it crosses now. Seems that we can go forward, right? So that fixes it. Why is that? We say again uh, to e disable just to enable autocomplete and uh, say print the address of the printer's hacks page entry page directory. Now it's allocated here. Entry page table allocated here. Print the the actual entry page directory itself. Wow, looks much cleaner. Like this is what we wanted. Actually, I don't think uh, I don't know how many entries are here. So cool entry page directory looks clean to us as well because we know that the address is this one, and so we moved by. Uh, I'm a little bit concerned that with this four. Not sure what was the four. I would 
I would imagine it shouldn't be four, it should be six here, but maybe it, there's still another bug which we have to debug. But if we say continue, uh, oh, it actually crashes here, right? So backtrace, uh, info, regs. Mm, EAP is uh, at some random memory address. Again, your hint, this is your intuition kicking in. You say, look, how did I end up with this address? That, that's not my kernel. My kernel sits at one megabyte. But OK, I'll leave it for you to debug what happens next. But at least this bug we fixed, right? OK, so most likely something is wrong with how the person uh, uh, fields in the page table. But uh, it looks at least that we are on a good track. So if I do here info PG, info, sorry. Uh, some info mem. So it says uh, still a little. So what is it says? No, actually it says that everything is mapped correctly here, right? So it's uh, up to what is this address? Is that what I asked to do in the homework? Eight megabytes. Okay, I'm free. Uh, or X uh, or B. Uh, yeah, looks looks correct to me. At eight megabytes. Right, so probably this works, but somehow we're still crashing. So we have to debug a little bit, bit more to understand why. But anyway, so that was my goal today to show you that this is how you use GDB. I, I get it. It was a little bit fast, but okay, again, we have live stream because a lot of people showed up. We'll probably have it next time as well with this attendance. So we can watch a recording next time. You say, okay, I really want to see how he uses GDB. So go ahead and just uh, watch a recording of that. Any questions about it? So again, I, I argue that you should use this tool chain to, to solve your homeworks uh, in the future because it will help a lot. Uh, with everything here, so ready to go back to the lecture. All good, no questions? Okay, so finally, after this uh, wonderful detour, uh, we are ready to start on our lecture today. So what we are doing is following. So remember, our goal is to get to the point when we boot into the first process, right? So we set up page table. Remember, we, we have a memory allocator, which can track uh, available pages. We know how to construct page table. Remember those functions map. We have a memory map of, with four regions, uh, which say this some region is bias, some is read-only, some is available. And another bias, so we have this uh, map range function, which maps a region of memory. And we have a function which walks a page table and can map a specific uh, virtual page to a specific physical page, right? And we say, okay, what else do we need? So clearly to run something meaningful, we need interrupts, right? Support for interrupts and exceptions. So roughly speaking, we done it here. We, we like executed these two lines of main. Uh, last time, and now intuitively, we need interrupts. So if I ask you a question, why do we really need to support interrupts? Maybe we can boot and live without interrupts altogether. Who can tell me? Uh, because sometimes the program will go into some error that just like you we see in the GDB. Correct. So sometimes, uh, and that's that was our problem, we like some programs have critical errors, like uh, they try to access a, a memory which is not mapped, and they actually trigger an exception, right? Yeah. And if we don't handle interrupts, we just seen it seen it in my previous demo. The result is a triple fault. Yeah. It's a hardware mechanism. I will explain it, but literally, when the first interrupt is not handled, the second interrupt, uh, the hardware tries to deliver the second double fault interrupt. Try to say, can you handle this one? Uh, something bad is happening. Again, we don't have an interrupt table, so the hardware cannot handle it. And then it, the hardware tree goes a triple fault. At this point, machine reboots, right? Mm -hmm. Hoping to recover this way. Mm -hmm. So one reason is uh, like critical errors. What else? What other reasons? User uh, input. So yeah, so user input or let's say device input. Yeah. Because uh, in the homework, I was asking, okay, construct the, 
a tiny UR device driver, which puts something on a console, but we, I never explain how to read something from a console, right? And that requires an interrupt because when a person presses a key on the keyboard, that triggers an interrupt. And at this point, the like execution of the operating system gets preempted. You start executing the interrupt handler and you can handle that, okay, like what is that, like which key the person pressed? It was H for hello. And so you can maybe output it on a screen or maybe you don't do it, anything with it, right? So stuff like that. Okay, device input. And the third reason? CPU sharing. Exactly. So we need to, to share the CPU, which means we need to do a context switch. And I like that we put this last because uh, it's we're processing a timer interrupt. But really, not always, right? So because you can imagine a program, a system which runs just a single one program. I don't know, maybe it's your sensor, like like embedded sensor, which uh, which just reads the temperature and nothing else is running from the operating system. And we, we saw we booted into Hello World. So the goal of our tiny toy example was just to print Hello World. And maybe that's enough, right? So maybe it's a... Uh, nothing else is running, but in a normal system, you can imagine that you will be ru running multiple programs, right? And the way to essentially switch between them is to say, to configure the hardware, to make sure that it sends or triggers a timer interrupt periodically. And you handle this interrupt and you switch to, a, to the next program in a queue, right? And that, that's how we implement time sharing. So we'll get to that, but uh, just give me a couple of weeks, probably, questions. You mean, uh, could you get away without? Uh, okay, that's a good question. So, okay, the question is like, to what degree you need those interrupts? So, imagine we have a, a software, hypothetically, which uh, is uh, bulletproof, never triggers an exception. A good step towards this software is, for example, a safe language like Rust. Rust still has exceptions occasionally because uh, there are some safety conditions which are which are checked at runtime. And so it, you can have an exception, right? But the next step towards this is to do something what we do in our this research operating system, which we're building right now, is to have a mathematical proof that this exception cannot happen, right? Okay, so you immediately rule out this. Right? You don't need them. So right now, I'll, I'll tell you the anecdote. Our system does not support exception yet because it's bulletproof. It boots, it never triggers an exception. Right now we're working on a timer because we're one time sharing, right? So you at least need, you say, okay, do I need to device interrupts? Yes and no, because modern devices are, you can always poll them. You can ask, okay, did anyone press a key? And uh, sometimes this polling model is more efficient compared to interrupt driven model. So like very fast devices like network IO, NVMe, they try to avoid interrupts, otherwise, the interrupts are delivered so quick, so so frequently that your system never does anything besides processing interrupts. You almost never see it on Windows or Mac, but on Linux, if you do IO heavy workload, so Linux has like slightly less user-friendly scheduler, you see that the, the, the system becomes kind of slowish right underneath. That's one of the reasons they don't uh, process device IO correctly. And uh, the last question is whether you can get out without support a timer interrupt. And the answer is yes. So if you design the software which periodically yields to, to the operating system saying, okay, like, do you want to run something next? Different program, right? So then it's fine. What do you do with the software which uh, has like infinite loops, which forgot and then the software developer forgot to put uh, a yield uh, primitive inside this loop? You can try to instrument the code on the fly to make sure that when you load the program, you make sure that every loop will have this yield primitive, but it's less elegant, but people are, it's more in the research question, but so you you can kind of, you can say yes, but maybe it's not ideal. So timer interrupts are still nice. Okay, cool. So we got this, uh, uh, let me move forward. So like just reiterate the previous slide, uh, to, uh, previous slide. So there are really like two main cases, synchronous interrupts. So we'll, will say that interrupts can be synchronous, meaning that you execute an instruction and it triggers an interrupt immediately, right? Because maybe you do division by zero, or maybe you access a page which is not mapped by the page table, right? 
So it's kind of like uh, those called those are called exceptions, right? Yeah, I they maybe okay. I say too many a case, right? Uh, yeah. So, but you got the point. So instruction really like at this point there is no way to move forward. So if you divide by zero, there is no meaningful way to to finish the computation because like it's undefined at this point. Asynchronous interrupts are notifications from external devices, like there's a network packet arrived or a keyboard was pressed, right? Or a timer interrupt was, was essentially like uh, triggered, right? And uh, that's fine, so we got it. So, But you got it that asynchronous, your code is running at user level, you're running some loop, you compute something, and a timer interrupt arrives and it preempts execution of your program, right? So this is asynchronous to the program. Nothing bad happened, it's just that there is like some event happened concurrently, right? And there is a third special case, which is also synchronous. On modern machines, interrupts are also used to implement system calls. I say on modern machines, but that's not entirely true because these days CPUs have a, a special instruction, which is called sysenter, which is slightly faster than an interrupt to, to, to enter the kernel, meaning switch from user level or less privileged level of execution switch into the kernel. And I will explain how it works. It will become clear, clear in a moment, but just believe me for a sec. But uh, up until this center instruction, operating systems were using int instruction. And int is an instruction which triggers an interrupt. And here I'm passing interrupt number x80, right? And this is how x 6 will be implementing system calls, right? It will be using, I think, int x40. Uh, got it? So those are the cases. Okay, just to make sure we understand how CPU handles an interrupt, let me go back to my wonderful diagram, right? So of the fetch, decode, uh, execute loop, right? So normally, like as normal, now again, in the beginning of the class, maybe this uh, drawing was a little bit confusing. Now it's completely clear. We have two registers, instruction pointer points to this instruction, happens to be addition, for example, stack pointer points to the stack, so CPU says, okay, what's my next instruction pointer, my next instruction address? Okay, let's assume it's there. It reads the instruction from memory. It decodes, it happens to be addition. Does the register read for RAX, RDX, executes the instruction, checks whether there wasn't like any exception occurring at this point, maybe nothing happened, then you commit, move to the next instruction, right? That's normal execution of the program. Now, what happens when some exception happened, right? It can happen in two cases, right? Either maybe you trying to jump to an instruction pointer, which is not valid, right? And we just saw it. We just saw in my demo today when we tried to we enable paging and the next instruction, we try to fetch instruction pointer, but the memory is not mapped. And so at this point, like the CPU does not, didn't know how to convert from a virtual address to a physical address and it, uh, created an exception, right? So at, that was essentially faulting us, this case, agree? The second case is when you executed instruction and maybe it was division by zero, for example. So you cannot really like do it, right? And so you can also have an exception here. But in both of those cases, you essentially move to the next step, which is this. Let me erase everything on the screen. Uh, at this point, the hardware tries to figure out how to execute the exception handler. Exception handler is a routine which operating system configures, which will be executed when on a specific interrupt, like a page fold, right? Division by zero, right? At a high level, the idea is uh, the following. Figure out the entry point to the instruction handler, interrupt handler or exception handler. So imagine that was your normal code and this is the position in memory where your interrupt handler is located and this is the very first instruction of it, right? So the hardware needs to figure out the instruction pointer. It also tries to switch the stack. Why is that? We can tell you. Why do we need to switch a stack? Correct. Correct. Because maybe the exception or is due to the fact that the stack is not configured correctly. It points to a page which is not mapped. Then of course you wouldn't be able to execute the instruction handler altogether, right? Or interrupt handler altogether. Uh, next step, 
pretty logical. Make sure that we can save the old values of the instruction pointer in a stack because we want to come back and maybe it's a timer interrupt. So we definitely will, will come back to this program, which we were running. So, and we're saving them, the hardware itself actually saves it, them instruction pointer and this old value of the stack on, on this new stack for the interrupt handler, right? And like both this instruction pointer of the inter ex exception handler and the stack for the exception handler are configured by the operating system. I will show you in a second, right? So it's not, it's, it's not baked in, into the hardware. This is a trading system when it boots, it configures them, right? Okay, so far so good. We save this all values, right? So that, that makes sense. Uh, and like save them here on a stack, right? And at this point we are, essentially not we are, but the hardware starts executing the first instruction of the exception handler, right? So essentially those, uh, like the general CPU register instruction pointer and the stack pointer are pointing to this new new values, right? And then we are back to this fetch decode execute loop and instruct exception handler is essentially same code as everything else. You can write it and see it will be running like any other part of your program, right? Is that clear? Okay, cool. So now let's uh, like just go and take a look at the details of how it actually works and uh, what needs to be configured and stuff like that, right? Okay. Uh, again, remember I said there might be two cases, right? Asynchronous interrupts are actually called interrupts. There is a lot of jar jargon here. So it, you, can, you can say like, you will look a little, when you say, people say exceptions for synchronous interrupts, right? Uh, and they say interrupts for asynchronous events, right? So it will be funky if you say a page fold interrupt. Typically people say page fold exception or stuff, stuff like that, right? Just, just remember, so this is synchronous and this is async. But no matter how the interrupt like is uh, from from which source it's originating, uh, the procedure to handle is the same, right? So and this is what we just discussed here. So at a high level, we stop execution of the current program, start execution of the interrupt handler as we saw just a second ago, in order to locate the entry to the uh, uh, interrupt handler, the hardware uses a special table it's kind of like an array for each interrupt. There will be an entry for zero, one entry, for two, another entry. Uh, and it's called interrupt descriptor table or IDT, right? And each interrupt is identified by a number. So essentially the hardware says, okay, I'm, I'm like this specific event triggered a specific number, right? Page fault is for example, is for example, number 14, uh, debug interrupt, uh, which passes control to the GDB is uh, number three, for example, right? Uh, so that's not super hard, kind of like intuitive. Uh, and when we process the interrupt, there might be two different cases. One case is uh, when there is no change in privilege level. I didn't really explain what privilege levels are. So like today and next time will be the first time I really explain what these are. But roughly speaking, we know that at least we know two. One is for the kernel, and it's a slightly more privileged uh, code because it can change the page table, change the global descriptor table. And there is user code, which definitely should not be able to change the page table because if any user program can change the page table, then there is no isolation and do whatever you want, right? So cool. So, but anyway, so interrupt can either cause a change in the privilege level uh, or it might not. So for example, there is no change if you're running uh, the CPU already runs kernel code in the most privileged level zero and a timer interrupt arrives or the kernel tries to access an unmapped page, right? That may be legal in a kernel. And at this point, there is no change. You still stay in the kernel. You process the interrupt, the timer interrupt in the kernel. Uh, or interrupt changes the privilege level, which means that you're running in a user level, running some kind of a user loop, for example, and a timer interrupt arrives and it passes control to the kernel, right? So there are these two cases, right? So let's first take a look at the case where the, there is no change in the privilege level. I'll make you this drawing, right? So you are already running in a kernel. So this is your kernel stack. It grows this way. There are like, uh, there are some arguments passed on the stack, some, you know, old frame pointer, return IP address, right? 
and uh, suddenly you receive a timer interrupt. Remember what I was just saying. So the hardware says, okay, I will locate the handler. Uh, first of all, I will, in this case, there is no change of the stack because we trust that uh, the, the most privileged level is good enough that it can uh, maintain its own stack correctly always. Again, I should make a slight uh, uh, warning here that it's not always the case. And there is a mechanism to switch a stack in this case as well. And Linux does it, X36 will not do it, right? But essentially what the hardware is, hardware is doing, it will save those, remember what I was saying, we will save here, instruction pointer, old instruction pointer, old stack pointer here, they got saved here. And at this point, uh, we have to locate the entry point of the uh, interrupt handler. Remember there is this table, interrupt descriptor table, and there is a special hardware register which holds the base of this uh, table. This is the register IDT, like I just, register is called IDTR. Uh, and the interrupt number, in our case, the uh, timer interrupt is a number 32. So we locate the entry point in this like 30 second entry in the interrupt descriptor table. And this contains the pointer to the entry, the very first instruction of the timer interrupt handler, which operating system configures when it boots, right? So an execution then jumps to this vector 32. So let's take a look at uh, any questions about it at this point. No, no, no. We are, there is no change in privilege level. We already running in a kernel. We're already running in a kernel. So everything. everything is kernel. We were running somewhere here in a kernel. This is the kernel stack, right? And uh, our instruction pointer was pointing somewhere here, but suddenly we got preempted with a timer. Um, API, can... Right, it has a limited number of entries, 256. And like in the current operating system, like they were not all, all of them are populated. All of them are populated? I'm asking, why is there scope to add more? Uh... No, unfortunately, unfortunately, this number right now is fixed. And you actually, there are cases where you can run into this limitation because uh, with modern devices, specifically even network devices, sometimes they are so powerful that can, they can handle multiple queues and they have like multiple packet queues, like say 16 or 32 or even more. And you might want to make a design choice to make sure that, uh, that each of these queues sends you a separate interrupt. So you're already like saying, okay, I need 32 interrupts just for this one device. And you also wanna send it to a specific core to avoid like some, we'll get to that like core coherence traffic, but essentially at some point, if you have a couple of those devices, you might start running out of interrupts. There are tricks how to address it, but it, it, it is a little bit of a limitation today. In the past, 256 looked like, wow, you will never run out of them. Today, it becomes with more cores and more device queues, uh, it becomes a limitation. So uh, are device drivers responsible for populating uh, part of the IDE? That Correct, yeah. Right, so some, I will talk about it next time, but some of those, uh, like especially old interrupts, like a timer, uh, like a UART keyboard, they have fixed numbers that comes from like, 20 years ago, when people saw that we can fix those interrupts numbers, there will be a very small number of those. And now it's almost like initially the table is not populated, but when the operating system says, okay, I see a new device, maybe, and you remember you operating system can, can support hot plug. So you just plug the network card. It sees then like there is a logic to query the, the IO bus PCI and say, okay, there's a new device and what do we do? And so on, and at some point device says, okay, I need like five interrupts, give me the numbers. And there is an interface between the operating system and the device driver, which says, okay, like allocate me a new interrupt vector. That's how it works. Any other questions? Almost, but not. Yeah, so it's a slightly different calling convention. You're right. Uh, in a language like Rust, uh, people, I think, pushed for an interrupt calling convention. 
In practice, it's not very helpful because there are so many corner cases that there is not a single polling convention. Uh, and why, I don't really remember, but I ran into this pro problem because originally I said, okay, I'll be so smart. I will use this calling convention. I will solve my problems. And then I figured out that no, it doesn't work. Uh, but in C, there is no call interrupt calling convention. Plus it also varies from, you can you can say it varies from like x86 to ARM to RISC, right? So the, the, the calling convention will be slightly different. Language can implement it, but typically. So the very first, this vector 32 label, is will be written in assembly. And then you will jump to C as fast as possible. But that's a good question. We'll, we'll take a look in a second. Uh, all good now? Okay, good. So just to make sure that we understand what this uh, interrupt descriptor table is about. So there is a hardware register uh, which contains the base and the size of the interrupt descriptor table. The max is 256. Just don't forget this. The register is on the CPU. The interrupt descriptor table is in memory, right? So because it's configured by the operating system and uh, it has uh, essentially entries, right? So one entry per interrupt number. And if you look into the entry and this, these figures, they come from the Intel manual. Maybe not from the most recent one. They just beautify them a little bit, but really the format didn't change, right? So it's called... Uh, for example, interrupt gate. So there's a ton of fields here, right? We don't really uh, care about all of them. What we currently wanna make sure we understand is that this vector offset or specifically the offset of the interrupt handler, where is it in this uh, uh, descriptor, right? So it's 64 bits for historical reason, like originally it was 16 bit, right? But now machine switched to 32 and so essentially or I forgot actually exactly the reason, but it's, it's split like that, right? And there are some additional flags here, right? And a segment selector. So this actually will choose your new code segment. And this, this will become critical for switching the privilege level later on. But right now it's not as important. Any questions? So, but this is one entry in this table. Cool, okay. So again, we talked a little bit about it. So, at a high level, it's the same code, but you write that the calling convention is different. And I'm glad that you guys, you think about it and you understand that, okay, yeah, the hardware will not push the EBP for you, right? So you have to be, you have to be careful, right? But uh, there is a specific calling convention, but so maybe a sequence of assembly code and then immediately C, right? And at a high level, interrupt descriptor table stores a pointer to the right handler, handler routine, right? Okay, so we got this. So this is exactly what we have. So this handler, right? So let's again go one more time and be very specific about what the hardware was doing when the interrupt arrives. So, and this is the case when there is no change in privilege level, but the hardware will do specifically this. It, it's again, it coming, comes from the Intel software developer manual. So the very first thing which the hardware is doing, it pushes these three registers. I said it pushes to instruction pointer and a stack. In practice, it also pushes another register, E flags. Can anyone guess why? What's E flags? Yeah, what's E flags? Good, good question. What's E flags? Is that the ID for the ID? Is that the ID for the ADT? No, E flags. Do you guys remember? It's a register. So remember when we were doing CMP instruction on Intel, instead of saving this result of the compare operation in, in a specific well, like explicitly placed register, like EAX, for example, it always put them in the E flags. And then you can say jump equal, for example, based on the flag set in the E flags, right? Yeah, there were like a bunch of bits for like greater than, equal, stuff like that, overflow. And it turns out, that this E flags on Intel also saves the bit which controls whether the next interrupt or whether the interrupt can be delivered or not. So essentially to disable interrupts, you actually change this bit. And it turns out that uh, when you do an interrupt transition, this bit can be changed. That's why they save the old value of the E flags. It will become again a little bit more clear, but essentially at high level, E flags can get changed 
exactly when you start processing the interrupt, because maybe interrupts were enabled in the eFlags e -flags register, and this very first interrupt disables them right away. And so the, that's why the eFlags changes, and you need to restore the previous value, and you don't know what it was, right? That's why the hardware saves it on a stack as well. Any questions? Good question. So code segment, like remember our long jump from the homework. Remember what we, why we did this long jump. We wanted to change CS, right. right? Right. So it turns out because I didn't want to go into those details, but the interrupt can choose a new code segment. It's kind of like a long jump on itself. And you might, or in most cases, you want to go back to the previous CS, right? That's why the hardware changes it, right? But the very good question. It will become more clear when the privilege level changes, right? And the same privilege level, or the CS probably will stay the same, but the hardware still saves it, right? But that's why. So all these three things might change immediately. And it's very important to understand why. Right. Right, because you will have two segments, two code segments, one for user and one for kernel. And one will be privileged, user privilege, three, and one will be privilege level zero for the kernel. We'll see it in a second. Okay, so we save the three. The, the hardware does it for us. Okay, that's kind of logical. And on the stack, right? On this interrupt stack. Some interrupts, and this is the funky part about the, that's where this calling convention kind of, I mean, it semi fails, but still works. Some interrupts push this error code and some don't, meaning that some interrupts will add an extra entry on the stack because they say, by I not only send you an interrupt, but I will also provide the error code, right? We'll see later how we handle it. But some of them do, some of them don't, according to Intel. Then we say, okay, let me erase everything here. We, from the interrupt descriptor table, we figure out the new CS register, right? So it replaces this one, right? The new instruction pointer, right? It replaces this one. So I say segment goes into CS, like a long jump instruction pointer goes into instruction pointer, right? From this, from the IDT table, that's logical, right? At this point, we're ready to start executing. Uh, as I say, if the call goes through a there is a, you can configure whether the further interrupts will be disabled. And so that's why I say this, the, the hardware clears the interrupt flag in the E flags register. That's why we save the old one. And we say the, the, the new interrupt E flags will, will not contain, will not enable further interrupts. Yeah. Uh, Right, so there is a lot of terminology and I don't wanna like go very deep into it. Uh, uh, there is this idea, again, at some point Intel was thinking that they're gonna like come up with very good terminology for everything and they call trap, I, if I remember correctly. Trap is the interrupt which disables further interrupts. Mm -hmm. When we will configure a, uh, an interrupt descriptor table, table in XV6, uh, we, We'll do the following. The system calls will not disable further interrupts because we treat them kind of like function calls, but just into the kernel. But the device interrupts like a timer or exception will disable further interrupts because at this point, it's very hard to essentially make a code which can handle concurrent interrupts, meaning that you can link a timer interrupt and other arrives maybe took you longer than expected. You have to be very careful with your code, what you're doing, right? And uh, so that's why uh, we will configure the entry in a table to say, look, there will be a special flag which says, okay, further interrupts will be disabled. And that's why this E flags is updated. This IF flag, interrupt flag in the E flags register will be updated saying that the next the further interrupts are disabled and it's called a trap. Kind of saying that, yeah, you will. And it's, it's, it's a mechanism which ensures your it shows atomicity of the interrupt handlers, right? Because you say, look, if I'm processing one interrupt handler, I will never get another one, which makes your, imagine like just writing the code 
in which you say, look, like I can receive another interrupt and my linked list, which I'm about to access will change because there will be another interrupt which changes it, right? So we'll talk a little bit, not a little, we'll talk more about it, but just bear with me for a sec for like maybe a couple of weeks actually, yeah. Exactly, good question. And I, I usually talk about it, but I'm glad that you noticed the difference. So can you disable exceptions? Does it make sense to disable exceptions? No, right, because if you are accessing a page which is not mapped, Wow, there is no way out. You have to handle it. So you can only, this interrupt flag controls asynchronous interrupts from the devices, right? And so we, I'll come back to it when we will talk about it more, but yeah, good point. So yeah, exceptions cannot be disabled. So, so when I was like you, I was also thinking, you can't really like you can, but it takes you like 20 pages of Intel manual to, to get to this point to understand that you cannot, right? But it makes sense, right? Any other questions? Good. Uh, and finally, not surprising, at this point, we can start executing the handler, right? What a stack pointer? You don't store stack pointer. You don't store the stack pointer, right? You don't. Good point. Remember, when we don't switch the privilege level, oh, okay. there is no change of a stack. And I will, I will cover the sequence next time, which changes the privilege level, and there will be a different stack. And specifically, it's important because the user can just say, look, I will set up my stack pointer to point to nowhere. And I will wait for the timer interrupt and I will cross the kernel this way, right? Because I, I configure my stack pointer to point to an unmapped page. I'm not going to touch it. Maybe I will just jump loop inside the code, not doing anything. But the moment the kernel gets a timer interrupt, we'll try to save something on that stack. The stack doesn't exist. So it's a double fault and so on, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. And so just before we quickly, just be, before we split, we still have five minutes. Uh, I wanted to show you this is how the stack looks like, right? So this was the instruction pointer pointing to some data here before the, the interrupt. Stack grows this way. This is the order in which the hardware pushes those values on a stack. That's essentially defined the calling convention. So if flags first, then code segment, instruction pointer, and if there is an error code, it's also pushed here, right? Okay, and at this point, sure. So I complete my diagram, instruction pointer now points to the interrupt uh, routine handler and everything goes like normal fetch the code execute loop there is a question how do we return from an interrupt right so clearly you cannot return from an interrupt in a way similar to how you return from a function right so the sequence is kind of like reverse from what we just seen there's a special instruction which is called irat interrupt return that returns it from an interrupt and it follows this calling convention so it's essentially instead of just jumping to the return value it restores the previous values of the code segment and the instruction pointers, pointer, right? It restores the E flags. Why not? Of course, it's logical, right? Restores the previous values of stacks pointer and stack segment and ESP. If there was a privilege change, right? And they were saved. If not, then you go uh, without restoring them, obviously. And uh, that might result in a stack switch, but might not if it, there was no. And at this point, since instruction pointer is restored, code segment is restored, E flags are restored, you can resume execution of what was running before the interrupt, right? Agree? Any questions? Correct. So, and uh, remember that's, that's a good example of instruction, which is most likely can be implemented as something what is called a pseudocode. Uh, is it microcode, sorry, on Intel, right? So Intel CPUs actually are programmable. So you can upload tiny programs inside the CPU, which will execute, which will emulate execution of specific instructions in software, which is written in their specific uh, microcode language. And the CPU executes actually those micro ops. So most likely interrupt return is implemented as a sub program in this micro ops, right? It's not a piece of silicon, it's a sequence of instruction. How does it run? So every time you boot, uh, BIOS loads a blob of microcode into the CPU. It's well protected. I don't think it's decrypted up, up until now. It's very well protected by Intel. And uh, sometimes you see microcode updates. Sometimes when you update the BIOS, you update the microcode, but I mean, probably 1% of people in this class ever updated the BIOS. 
And typically microcode updates are loaded by the operating system on boot. And essentially you say, look, I know that there was a critical bug in the Intel CPU. So I'll like, upload new microcode to fix it. That's what happens. And that's how the fixes are done. Is it, is it general view? Or is it specific to that case number one where there's no change? Sorry, I like in case number one, this step will be absent, right? And this will be absent, but it, they, like we'll get to case number two, but it, it, it's like, it's very, very similar. It's, the only difference is that in case number two, those will be pushed on the stack as well. And there is a slightly, there will be a logic for how to switch the privilege level. And I will explain it ne next time. But other than that, it's pretty, it's the same. Okay, let's stop here. So next time we will cover essentially the processing of the interrupt across privilege levels. I just wanted to say thank you to everyone who showed up today because I, I'm happy with the attendance, which means that I will continue the live streams, but I ask everyone to show up as well. Or like, at least you can rotate, you can do whatever you want. I ask, like, I, I, would, I would argue that you will benefit from looking at me, right? But still, thank you.